Good morning. My name is Vicky Bengtson. I'm an ecologist and I work with nature conservation and have worked with issues regarding ancient and veteran trees for almost 30 years. Uh, I come from uh, Scotland originally, but I have worked around about half of my career in England and the last uh, 17, 18 years I've been based in Sweden, but work in several countries across Europe with regard to the management of ancient and veteran trees, so I consider myself very lucky. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ancient trees in urban areas, problems, opportunities and solutions, and some of the examples come from Sweden but some come from other countries as well. Now, I know you were expecting to be listening to Jonas Hedin but unfortunately he's unable to be with you so um, I've taken his place. So this is a, a beautiful avenue from a place just near to Stockholm where it's wonderful old ash pollards in the grounds of an estate which is also a sixth form college. So today or this morning I want to talk to you about several different things. Briefly I want to talk about why trees can live so long. It's one of the things that fascinates me. I think already you'll have heard about why they're so important but I'll touch on that briefly. Then it's a little bit about where they are, because that's really crucial to dealing with the problems and the solutions. And then finally, I want to talk a bit about, give you some examples of where, of different things and ways uh, trees have been managed in these slightly more challenging environments. So I always like to bring up the issue of tree time when thinking about working with old trees, that in our lifetime, when we're working 40, 50 years perhaps at best, and an old oak tree has hardly come out of puberty by that time if it's germinated at the same time as, as we started working. And this tree is a fabulous example of that because if we were to look at that tree in 1910, which is when the first photograph was taken, and then again look fast forward to 2009 and the photograph of the same tree, I wonder how many of us would have guessed that that's actually how it would look after a hundred years. And I think it's a wonderful example of trees and their resilience and their change over time is extremely slow and that we need to take that into account when managing them. And the fact that trees can reinvent themselves, so they have the ability to produce new shoots, new leaves, new branches from basically any of their living tissue and they can reduce their crowns, they can increase their crowns, they can renew their crowns, they can do the same in the root system. And it's a wonderful capacity, which means that they can both adapt to their environment, albeit slowly, but they can also go through periods of reiteration and renewal. And it means they, in essence, could potentially live forever. Now we know that they don't, but they have that capacity and I think that's very humbling and should be something that we take account of always when working with our veteran trees. So I think you've already heard the value. They're like living blocks of flats. They house a huge range of organisms, much of which we're only just scratching the surface in terms of understanding. And I've just a few photographs here of a fungi, a lichen and a stag beetle. And this is a tree that's protected in Sweden and contains all of these species. And that's just, I love that fact that we're still learning so much about our old trees. And each individual is exactly that. It's an individual, but it also hosts a variety and different range of species. And an old oak can host a whole range of species. So, I mean, one individual may have two, three hundred species. Uh, but they can have the potential to host up towards a thousand different species, at least in Sweden and in, in much of Northern Europe. And I think you've maybe already much about hermit beetle. Um, we know that 80% of European saprocylic beetles are threatened. They're the most threatened species community in Europe. Many of those are associated with old trees. So, And that figure has, has gone up in terms of numbers. It was 11% when the last IUCN report was taken. So that really shows us that we've got a lot of work to do to ensure the survival of the old trees that we have left in our landscape, but also 
ensure that we have all trees in the future. But then I don't think we should forget that old trees also have an important cultural context, a heritage value, that they tell us something about our past and they connect us to our past. So the tree you can see on the right is called Kvilleken or Rumskulleken, and that tree is about 16 metres round. It takes more than 10 people to join hands and circle that tree. It's probably towards a thousand years old. It has a fabulous history, what that must have seen. And then the tree on the on the left is from Windsor in England and is has a similar age, probably, although we can only really guess at the age because the trees are very hollow. But when you just begin to imagine that the kings and queens that have, that have ridden past that tree, that have fought wars or hidden from enemies, and I think that's one of the things we often forget is that old trees... They, they create a sense of well-being, they create a sense of stability and a sense of history. And we mustn't underestimate that, particularly in our urban environments where people are. So where do we find our old trees? Well, originally, probably most of them were in what we might call wood pastures or wooded meadows with grazing animals and not a house in sight. But today, we know that many of our old trees are actually close to people. They're in more urban environments. And avenues are the, are the classic example of that, whereby they, they can be in the middle of cities. They can be obviously out in, in the countryside as well, in estates or more formal landscapes. Churchyards. I'm not sure of your, your history that you have with regard to churches and trees, but in Sweden, uh, trees were planted in a ring around the churchyard in order to keep away evil spirits but also to create solace and they're extremely important and then in the UK we have yew trees that are often um, in relation to churchyards so it's an area where we have often many old trees but then of course we have them you know squeezed in amongst other things amongst the, um, <laughs> the urban environment and I love this photograph oak tree garage and here is the oak tree full of concrete and you wonder how long this oak tree will actually last in relation to a garage, which must be full of all sorts of horrible things that are getting into the roots. And you wonder really where the roots are, in fact, because there's very little area whereby water might get through. But it's often the case that we have old trees remaining in development areas where potential conflicts develop. There are conflicts in relation to development. The picture on, on the left is from Belgium, whereby... You can see that the fence is just way too close to the tree. The picture on the right is from some work that was being done in a churchyard in, in Sweden. And you can see that roots, trees don't have roots, according to this picture, because a fence has been put up around the stem, which is great because it avoids damage there. But I find it very commonly the case that in urban areas, people just forget that trees have roots. Then there can be other issues like felling. And felling and inappropriate management is much more common in urban areas than it is out in the countryside. People have much greater risk aversity, so they're afraid that trees are going to fail. Then we have vandalism, which is also an issue much more common in urban environments. But then we can't forget tree diseases because tree diseases have an impact on how people perceive trees. And we've got more and more tree diseases that are coming to Europe and that in combination with climate change mean potentially that we've got more to deal with and that's a, a threat. It's a threat to all veteran trees regardless of where they occur, but it's certainly something perhaps that's more obvious and acute in the urban environment. So there are conflicts between users, as I've mentioned. A good friend of mine who gave me this photograph here, Ted Green, he talks about cars being attracted to trees because that's where the shade. And so, of course, when we park our cars, we want to find a bit of shade if it's sunny weather but that can lead to all sorts of problems you can see that the tarmac's all cracked here from from the roots and these things kind of develop slowly that suddenly you know people were parking under the tree and somebody thought oh well we better put tarmac down and then the tarmac comes and then the tarmac breaks up and then the whole cycle if you like of decline for that tree will develop and then you have risk I think that's one of the biggest concerns that I often have with regards to management of old trees is that we perceive them to be high risk. Um, but then, of course, it can be 
conflict between users. So we've, you know, on the picture on, on the right here, we've got the power lines, we've got the car, we've got the signposts. And all of that means that the tree, the space the tree can take is reduced. So how can we help to deal with this? Well, the common suggestion is to put up a fence around the trees because that deals with several problems. It stops people getting in too close. It reduces potentially the option of having to do pruning on the tree um, and it allows still people to, to appreciate it. But in this case, this was a tree that was so popular. It's called Druid's Oak and the tree had a fence put around it. But then people walked around that fence. You can see here on the on the on the picture that the, the desire line, the footpath where people went, and actually this is where all the fine roots were, which meant that the tree actually declined more in health when the fence was put up. So it became clear that a new fence needed to be put up and extended further out. And the area was then mulched within that area. And now people can still really enjoy the tree still, but without causing any damage. So fencing is sometimes a good option. A boardwalk is another one. There's a tree in Belgium where they've created a beautiful boardwalk which allows people to get relatively close to the tree but without damaging the roots. But then I think the thing that I think is most obvious to deal with with regard to old trees is moving the problem. Now I say these two were messing about on a bench under a huge large old branch that you can see above their heads. And I don't know how many conversations I've had with people about how shall we prune this branch? What shall we do? We never discuss about moving the bench. And actually, that's a much simpler, cheaper operation. You don't have to come back. You do it once and the job's done. So I think that's something we need to be much more conscious about. It's an opportunity, I guess, in the urban area for us to actually think about what's under the trees and in close proximity to the trees and actually move them rather than undertaking pruning on the trees. But this is one of the areas as well where safety then becomes an issue, that we don't look at moving the bench, we look at pruning the tree from a safety point of view and it becomes this vicious circle of potential decline and eventually the tree will suffer and go. This is another example. This is uh, where the, a tourist train went across along this, this track this, beside this tree. This is a very old sweet chestnut that's also surrounded by beach and was suffering from shade. And I think this is a wonderful example whereby you can make the, the the story of this particular tree that is one of the oldest in the area. Now, we often laugh in Belgium that they don't have many old trees left. They almost know them all by name. And that means, though, that there's extra care taken potentially with those trees that they have left. So they were able to divert the tourist train. They were able to get some more money when the awareness was raised about it and clear some of the birch, the beach, sorry, from around that tree. So that's a, a really nice, positive story. And then vandalism, which was one of the other problems that I mentioned. This is a tree, the Prince Eugene Oak in, in Stockholm. And this tree has had everything done to it you can possibly imagine, but in order to save it. And I think it's a wonderful story. And it's also a bit of a reflection of the history of our borough culture. It's got, you can't see, but there is a cable attaching, I think it's just there, there's a cable attaching the branches to a big rock, a big boulder here on the side in order to keep the tree up. I think there was a worry it was splitting. And then this is a huge cavity where someone had set fire to it, but luckily they managed to get it out before it did any damage to the tree. But now they've done this beautiful construction of, of covering the cavity, not so that insects can't get in but just so that people can't get in and undertake the damage and then they've covered it so carefully with oak bark to try and make it look more natural and I think it's just a I mean it's it's very interventionist and and that can be a philosophical discussion but this tree is loved and it's taken care of in an urban situation and there's a story behind it as well which I think also evokes interest from people but I think the thing that we mustn't forget is old trees need space. And even with the best of intentions, you can end up with a situation where conflict arises. And this is an example from a housing estate where it was an old wood pasture with lots of old oaks. And the white house in the photograph shouldn't 
have been built according to the original plans to give this oak tree a bit of space. But for whatever reason, a house suddenly appeared there. And the tree's got some space. It's certainly better than, than it might have been. But the problem we have is the people who live in the White House, their bedroom window is up there by on the upper floor and the branches from the oak tree scratch the window. So you can imagine when it's a windy day, they don't get a lot of sleep. So they're ringing up the local council and complaining about this oak tree. And I guess this is the real thing that I would stress is that the importance of planning and the importance of giving the trees space. If you want to keep them, and we want everyone to do that if it's possible, you need to ensure there's adequate space for the tree to continue to survive. Because if there isn't, then the tree is probably, its days are numbered. This particular oak tree has now had a pruning done of it because the neighbours were complaining. They're already complaining about all the oak leaves that are messing up the front and so on. And, and I mean, I'm sure you all have this kind of experience. And this is a lovely example, I think, of, of where an oak tree wasn't given a lot of space in a car park. It was given some space, but it really was in severe decline. And it it's part of a bigger wood pasture landscape. And ironically, this car park is visitor visitors to this lovely wood pasture landscape, which is just near a town. So this construction was created around the base of the tree that you can see here and it was filled with with wood mulch and this is kind of well composted wood mulch four or five centimeters deep and the tree has really come back and also what's lovely I think is that people are interested it looks more formal and it looks looked after and people take much more care before this ground here people park their cars under it because there was there was nothing to stop them from doing it even if the, the tarmac was here because when the car park was full we just parked under the tree and here was some shade as well as I've mentioned earlier so I think this is a really lovely way of helping ensure that a tree can survive and has the space it needs plus and is retained and this is a this is a really lovely story because the tree's now in really really good condition then there's this other issue of safety and risk which is is a common one that we all have to deal with in relation to the urban environment and roads and traffic and so on. And this is a, a, another, I think, good example of a way of dealing with it. So firstly, a fence has been put up here. The tree has been pruned and it has a huge cavity here. So it's a very important tree. It has lots of red data book species on it. And of course, felling would have been one option, but the least desirable option. So this tree now has a tether or a guy, a, a, a wire here, which has anchored it to the ground within this uh, fenced area, because the worry was that it would fall onto the road, basically. So now with this in place, the idea is that if the tree begins to fall, it will fall away from the road, which has allowed this tree to survive and be kept and retained. And ultimately, that really is our main objective, even in urban areas, because actually wherever we have our veteran trees, they are important and they've often been left behind in as a part of kind of a historic wood pasture but development has come roads and housing estates have come but we still I hope would want to do our best to retain as many as possible and this is an example from Sweden which was actually an elm avenue and there was a lot of issues of conflict there with the road and the worry of branches falling down into the road. But it's also in a part of Sweden, which is extremely valuable in terms of the species associated with old elm. And there's been a kind of a 10 year plan for this avenue, whereby you can see they've been created these monoliths, these standing structures. So instead of completely renewing and felling the whole avenue, the trees are being done in stages as and when Dutch elm disease starts to affect them, but to try and retain as much as possible of the standing dead tree. And sometimes actually these trees do produce new shoots. Now, it's not necessarily very pretty, but it does ensure that we retain the biodiversity value for as long as possible. And this is a way in which you can potentially make these retained dead wood uh, elements more natural because my experience if I go back to the previous photograph is that people often react to these straight flat cuts that they see this as a an unnatural 
um, feature in the landscape, and particularly if it's been an avenue, which by its very nature is intended to be a feature in the landscape. But by doing some slightly more artistic cutting using a chainsaw, you can actually make it look much more natural. So retain the dead wood. And when we did this project on a site where I worked many years ago, when we cut these trees and branches with flat cuts, people reacted. Whereas when we did these slightly more artistic cuts, then they just didn't even notice that we'd done any work on those trees. It does take us a little bit more time, but it may be worth doing in those areas where there's high visibility and the aesthetics, the way the trees look, it's very important. And to gain public support. So I'm just going to show a very short film. Which Many veteran this. trees are found in urban areas. The principles of how to manage these trees are just the same as those in more rural locations, but the pressure on the trees may be caused by different factors. Veteran trees in these locations are even more likely to be valued for their aesthetic, heritage or social values. For people living in cities, trees are an important connection to nature and studies have shown that they are important for human health. But these same trees can also be under enormous stress and are frequently physically damaged. Different countries may have their own legislation on the protection of veteran trees. This video shows some general principles about managing veteran trees in urban locations. Appropriate risk management of veteran trees is also very important, but is covered by a separate video. Trees in towns and cities are often growing in drought conditions because the water cannot soak through the hard, compacted surfaces around them. In addition, trees may only have effective roots on one side, as the other side is blocked by trenching for services like electricity or the foundations of buildings. The recommended root protection area for a veteran tree is 15 times the trunk diameter. This large RPA is important to reduce the possibility of damage or disturbance to the roots. Such a large RPA is sometimes hard to achieve in towns and cities, but at least aim for it. If the veteran tree has already lost part of the RPA to development in the past, protection of the rest of the root area is particularly important. If any work needs to be carried out around a veteran tree, long-term planning is crucial. Otherwise trees might be lost in the process, like in this historical Lyme Avenue. When work is actually taking place, the tree must be physically protected with strong fencing, ideally on the edge of the RPA, not like on these construction sites. The roots of veteran trees must also be protected from compaction, even from footfall. Compaction negatively affects the normal functioning of the soil and the roots. Even in urban locations, trees may still have important wildlife values, and it is important to check if there are protected species present before doing any work. In addition, the tree should be checked for any special local significance. If local people value the tree, they will help look after it. Even dead and dying veteran trees have great biodiversity value wherever they occur and should be retained. The canopies of veteran trees in towns and cities are often pruned for the wrong reasons. For example, to make it easier for contractors to work around it. Veteran trees should only be pruned by skilled arborists and only if this is considered necessary for their long-term survival. Veteran trees in urban environments are frequently subject to a great deal of stress, which may not always be obvious. Management should aim to alleviate stress and not add to it. In this way, the best chance of long-term survival is reached and the tree can continue to be appreciated by everyone. So that was just a summary for the film we've produced as part of the VETSET project, which I'm talking about shortly, uh, to help illustrate and summarise the issues in relation to veteran trees in urban areas. So just in the last part of my talk now, I want to talk a little bit about the creation of, of decaying wood and managing dead wood in urban environments and different ways that that can be done with some examples from Sweden and elsewhere. Um, information. I don't think we can talk enough to people about the importance of old trees and decaying wood. And I'm sure that's something that you're very experienced at doing. And this is an example actually from a Natura 2000 site in the Czech Republic with a tree that had fallen over that they re-erected and used as a place to tell people about the history of the site 
and the values associated with old trees. And this is from a city in uh, Sweden where uh, an old elm tree, which actually had the hermit beetle in it, that they retained, but also put a sign up to explain why a standing dead tree was retained. And again, this has stood there for more than 10 years. And I think that's a really good example of how we can actually retain deadwood even in the middle of our city. Then you can make it into art. This is an example. This is actually <laughs> a moss, Zygodon forsteri, which is found normally in water pools and roots, uh, the buttress roots on beech trees. And it's a very rare species on this site and elsewhere. And the site here used a piece of deadwood to turn into art and to also illustrate something of the species that have been associated with the old trees. And I love this. And this is actually Jonas. This, these trees had to be felled as part of a, a development project, a road project. And Jonas arranged for the traffic, the highways agency, to move these huge lumps of wood to a nature reserve where they could be re-erected. So they dug them into the ground and stood them up. And within 24 hours, he found red data book species investigating these particular pieces of wood. So whilst we'd prefer the trees to be standing, this was a really good way to make the best out of what was a far from ideal situation. He also, they paid for these kind of small holes and areas and cavities to be created, which allowed um, Jonas to actually have a look and see what species were coming in. Then also some work has been done on what we call veteranization, which is creating uh, habitats in young trees. Now often this isn't something we're doing in urban environments and it's a technique used to bridge the gap between old trees and young trees and this is just a photograph of a woodpecker hole that was created with a chainsaw after eight years and this is a nut hatch that's using it for nesting. It's just a really fabulous example I think of ways in which we can create habitats that are otherwise only found in old trees but in young trees. Now, these are not always suitable, as I said, in urban environments, but if there are trees that are not near to the path or trees that would otherwise have to be felled, it's potentially a technique that can be used. So creating woodpecker holes using a chainsaw is one. This is creating a cavity uh, whereby a section of the, the trunk is removed. But this one I wouldn't recommend in urban areas, but I just wanted to show you a photograph of the different techniques we've been, we've been doing uh, in Sweden and in England. Then another thing that's been done in Sweden with a lot of work and elsewhere are these wood mould boxes. So where you've got a few hollow trees, it's creating a box and then filling it full of the material that would be found otherwise in hollow old trees. And these are kind of multi-purpose boxes. They've, they've got slits here which are suitable for bats and they've got a hole on the other side which are suitable for birds. And then the material in the bottom is filled up with sawdust and leafy material and so on. So these are providing another gap or bridging another gap between the old trees and the next generation. And it's something that's being done both in urban areas and out in the wider countryside. But it's been very successful in urban areas and is a really good opportunity to put a sign up to explain why that this is, you know, homes for the homeless is one of the signs that's been used um, to explain that you know, the, the lack of decaying wood habitat that we've got in our landscape. This is another technique that's been used. This is primarily for the stag beetle, but that we talk about decaying wood and the different sorts of decaying wood that are required, both standing, falling, in the ground, wet, dry, sunny, so on and so forth. And the picture shows on the right, these are the other type of wood mold boxes, so a smaller version. And this is, again, material that was actually partly cleared from partly from clearance work that had been done elsewhere and they often usually have a sign up to explain what this is all about. So finally I just want to say that many of our very special veteran trees are in urban areas and are around people. This tree is in in uh, from Romania and is in a zoo and Fortunately, it's leaning towards a lake, but a fence has been put up. It has the ceramics, the beetle in it. It has benches nearby and there's information about this tree that it's older than the zoo. And I think that's something that we must 
must never forget that many of these trees predate the urban environments in which they find themselves. And we can use that to our advantage to, if you like, sell the benefits of these fabulous old trees. So further information, there are several books that have been published and these are actually available digitally. Um, they're freely available online. They, they're both sadly in English, but this, the one on the, the right is also in several other languages, although I'm not sure how useful that is for you. It's in uh, Spanish and Basque and uh, in um, Flemish and in Swedish. And the book on the right has been published in Flemish and in Romanian. So um, that's all I have to say, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening.